Welcome to the program entitled Overcoming Access Barriers and Practice Challenges to PCSK9 Inhibitor Implementation. My name is Dr. Michael Block and I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Nevada School of Medicine and Medical Director of Vascular Care at Renown Institute for Heart and Vascular Health, both in Reno, Nevada. Here you see my disclosures. This program is sponsored by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HMP company. This activity was supported by educational funding provided by Amgen and Santa Fe US and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Here are today's learning objectives. We will review the latest clinical trial evidence supporting the use of PCSK9 inhibitor therapies within the secondary prevention of cardiovascular events. We will examine updates to guideline recommendations and expert consensus statements regarding the role of non-statin therapies for the treatment of hypercholesterolemia and management of established cardiovascular disease. We will identify specific patient populations that would benefit from LDLC lowering utilizing PCSK9 inhibitor therapies. We will develop strategies to overcome barriers that preclude access to PCSK9 inhibitors, including prior authorizations, insurance denials, and inconsistencies in the interpretation of prescription language. And lastly, we will learn to translate the latest evidence, update guidelines, and potential resolutions to access-related barriers to the individualized and targeted treatment of hypercholesterolemia and the management of established cardiovascular disease. So we're going to start with a patient case, and we're going to follow this patient case throughout this presentation. So this patient, uh, we will uh, use the initials LR for this patient. Uh, LR is a 69-year-old man who presents to the emergency department with one and a half hours of stuttering precordial chest pain and associated shortness of breath and nausea. He reports that these symptoms are different from what he experienced when he had a prior MI. His past medical history is notable for hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, uh, type 2 diabetes, and he has known coronary artery disease. He had an MI three and a half years earlier, treated with PCI of the uh, LAD artery using a drug-eluting stent. He also has GERD and osteoarthritis. His meds at presentation included aspirin, 81 milligrams a day, simvastatin dosed at 40 milligrams a day, lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide, 40 slash 12 and a half milligrams a day, omiprazole, metoprolol succinate, uh, 50 milligrams a day, and ibuprofen as needed. In terms of social history, he had a 29 pack year history of tobacco abuse, but he quit in 2015, which was a couple of years before his presentation. Social alcohol use, no illicit drug use, and uh, notably, he had very significant myalgias with both atorvastatin and resuvastatin, but has been tolerating his simvastatin now for a couple of years. Family history is notable for a mother who experienced a TIA at age 63, so he does have a family history of premature cardiovascular disease. On physical exam, he's 5'10", 219 pounds, which leads to a BMI of 31.4. Uh, his blood pressure is 146 over 92, and his heart rate is 102. When you look at him on exam, uh, there's no evidence of any arcus, no xanthelasma, which would be uh, signs of cholesterol deposition, uh, normal JVP, no carotid bruise. He is tachycardic, uh, has a regular rate and rhythm, normal S1 and S2, no murmurs. Uh, his pulmonary exam is notable for a prolonged expiratory phase, mild wheezes, but no crackles. And on extremities, he has no edema, no xanthelomas, and uh, normal pedal pulses. In terms of his diagnostic imaging, uh, he, we did an e ECG in the emergency room. He's found to have normal sinus rhythm with a rate of 98, but there were new two to two and a half millimeter downsloping ST segment depressions in the inferior lateral leads. No Q waves were noted. For his uh, blood workup, uh, serum creatinine was noted to be 1.3 milligrams per deciliter. His peak troponin uh, I was 7.92 milligrams per deciliter. We have a lipid panel available to us, which showed a total cholesterol of 206, an LDLC of 129, HDL of 38, triglycerides of 193, and a lipoprotein A of 90 nanomoles per liter. He was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed with a type 1 non-ST segment myocardial infarction. He was given IV and fractionated heparin, aspirin times 4, so a, a total of uh, 300, uh, over, uh, 320 milligrams of aspirin and metoprolol succinate 25 milligrams times one in the emergency department. He was rushed to the cath lab where he was found to have a 95% mid-RCA stenosis with a thrombus that was treated with a drug-eluting stent. So this case presentation leads to a number of questions. I think I'd like to start with whether or not this patient was being treated with guideline recommended LDL cholesterol lowering at the time of his presentation. And then we can start looking at what changes we might want to make to optimize his treatment regimen now that he is presented with a second heart attack. So to answer that question, I think it's important to go back and focus on the 2013 uh, uh, 
blood cholesterol guidelines that came from the ACC AHA. Um, these, uh, as I mentioned, were published in 2013, uh, so this is actually a fairly dated document now, about five years old, uh, but nonetheless, I think, uh, has some very important uh, components to it. And probably at the center of this guideline is the fact that we should be thinking about statins in four different patient populations. Uh, three of those patient populations are shown on this slide. Uh, first is clinical uh, cardiovascular disease, particularly atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which this patient represents. Um, second group are patients who have an LDL cholesterol at baseline greater than 190, and these are, are usually patients who have a phenotype of uh, a familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a monogenic uh, cause of, uh, of high LDL cholesterol. We should be thinking about statin therapy in diabetics who are age 40 to 75. And then the fourth group that's not shown on this slide is in primary prevention, we should be considering a discussion of statin therapy with our patients who are age 40 to 75 and have a 10-year calculated cardiovascular event risk of about 7.5 or higher. So this patient obviously falls into one of those four groups. The, he falls into the group at the top of this slide, those with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in each of these groups, these guidelines call not just for using a statin, but they also call for the, which intensity of statin that we should be using. Um, so in patients with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, like this patient, um, we really look at uh, the intensity of statin therapy based upon age. So in a patient who's greater than 75 years of age or who for whatever reason is not a candidate for high-intensity statins, uh, we generally recommend a moderate-intensity statin. For those patients, however, who are less than 75 years of age, like our patient, generally we're calling for a high-intensity statin. And there really are only two drugs that are, are considered high-intensity statins. Uh, that would be a torvastatin at a dose of 40 milligrams or 80 milligrams a day, or resuvastatin at a dose of 20 milligrams or, or 40 milligrams a day. Um, so this patient was not currently on high-intensity statin when he presented. Now, that may have been because of uh, an inability to tolerate high-intensity statins, but I think it's important to note that this patient was not quite managed as aggressively as possible. He was on a moderate-intensity statin at the time of his presentation. And certainly, that may have a, a role in the uh, recurrence of events. We know from multiple different uh, uh, endpoint studies using statins that it appears that the lower we drop LDL cholesterol, or really more specifically, the more aggressively we treat uh, cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, the fewer events that we have. Um, so when we have agents and drugs that can get LDL cholesterol down to below 70, for example, we see a, a fewer events than in clinical trials that use moderate intensity statins um, or uh, that use placebo where the achieved LDL cholesterol was much higher. So we really do have a lot of uh, evidence that in this patient population, using a high intensity statin offers a significant advantage in terms of reducing uh, second cardiovascular events. So that of course leads to the question of how well we actually do at implementing high intensity statin in these patients. And quite frankly, if we even take a step backwards and, uh, and look at whether or not we're using statins at all in these patients, I think some of the real-world data is a little bit concerning. What you see on this uh, slide is a meta-analysis of over a million patients that were in an observational registry, which was known as Pinnacle. Um, this registry is a little bit dated. The data comes from between 2008 and 2012, but I'm not sure that the contemporary data is really much different than this and other data sets that we've taken a look at. And what you see on this slide, if we just focus on group one, which is highlighted on this slide, um, what you see is that almost 30% of patients who have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are not on a statin at all, not even talking about whether or not they're on a high-intensity statin. 30% of these are, are not on statin at all. And so certainly there is an opportunity to get statin therapy on board in more of these patients. Now, there may be some reasons why these patients aren't on statins. The patient uh, case that we're talking about today, for example, it sounds like high-intensity statin was attempted, and it sounds like it was attempted twice. Um, but I think that the onus is really on us to make sure that we're trying to get this uh, evidence-based high-intensity statin on board in each of our patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So if we turn our attention back to our case and we decide what we're going to do with this patient's lipids after he's discharged from the hospital, it in my practice, I think probably the best course of action would be to try a high-intensity statin again, to try a torvastatin 40 or torvastatin 80, or to try resuvastatin 20 or 40. That would be the most evidence-based uh, intensity of statin to try. 
but we'll say for the sake of argument that the patient was very resistant to that, um, or you tried it and we were unable to uptitrate the patient to uh, high intensity statin therapy. Um, so this patient remained on simvastatin 40 milligrams a day, and the decision was made to add a zetamide 10 milligrams a day uh, to his uh, lipid lowering therapy. And as you can see, that achieved an LDL cholesterol of 101, an HDL of 38, and a triglycerides of 168. And if you calculate his non-HDL cholesterol, which is the total cholesterol minus the HDL, you'll see that he has a non-HDL of 135. And that uh, brings us to the obvious question as to whether or not that is significant enough lipid lowering for this patient, or should we be trying to do something more aggressive to get his LDL cholesterol and non-HDL down further? So one, I think, very important point that comes out of this case is that it is very important to, to check a follow-up lipid panel to determine whether or not a patient has appropriate response to their prescribed lipid-lowering therapy. Um, this is actually very well stated in those 2013 ACCHA guidelines. Um, we should be, once we start statin therapy, we should be checking a lipid panel at between 4 and 12 weeks to make sure that we are seeing the appropriate anticipated therapeutic effect. In general, the reproducibility of the effect of statins is very high. Um, in most patients, you'll see the same reduction, percent reduction in LDL cholesterol with a particular agent and a, a particular dose. In general, high-intensity statins should get about approximately a 50% reduction in LDL from baseline, and a moderate-intensity statin, like this patient is on, um, should get about a 40% reduction in LDL cholesterol from baseline. If you don't see that anticipated reduction, it's important to go back and talk to that patient about why we might not be seeing it. Yes, there are a few people who don't seem to respond uh, pharmacologically uh, well to statins, but in the vast majority of these cases, um, it's actually an issue of adherence. And so making sure that patients are taking their statin every day if we don't see the appropriate, uh, uh, the appropriate uh, expected response after starting a statin. And then we continue to follow up these patients uh, at least every 3 to 12 months um, to make sure that they are continuing to have that anticipated therapeutic effect. So back to our question of whether or not we should be pushing this patient's LDL cholesterol level lower. Um, I think there's a, quite a bit of data that suggests that lower LDL cholesterols are better. And if we just look at the, our statin studies, um, what you see here on this slide is a meta-analysis from eight randomized statin trials that included almost 40,000 patients. And what you see if you look at the uh, achieved LDL cholesterol um, in these studies, um, it becomes pretty clear that lower does appear better. Patients who got their LDLs down below 70 had fewer events than those who had higher achieved LDLs. And even patients who got their LDLs down below 50 achieved to have an even better clinical response um, with a lower rate of recurrent cardiovascular events. So this certainly raises the hypothesis that pushing LDL cholesterol down lower, lower than what we see with our patient, may have a therapeutic benefit. So how do we go about proving that hypothesis? Um, well, since the guidelines were published in 2013, um, we do have a number of clinical trials, um, a few of which I'm going to share with you today, that do show that if we add non-statin therapy to statin therapy to lower LDLC further, we do see an improvement in events. And this was the specific hypothesis that was tested in the Improve It study, um, which looked at the impact of azitamibe and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, so this was really a landmark study. Um, uh, the methodology is shown here on this slide. There are 18,000 patients who were post-ACS who were randomized to either simvastatin by itself or simvastatin plus azitamide for seven years. And as you can see on the left side of this slide, the addition of azitamide to simvastatin led to a significant uh, decrease in LDL cholesterol, such that those who were on simvastatin monotherapy had an LDLC of about 70, while those who were put on azitamide plus uh, simvastatin had an LDLC of about 55. And that additional reduction in LDLC led to a statistically significant reduction in events, as shown in the Kaplan-Meier curves on the right side of this slide. Um, this was statistically significant. It was not a, uh, from an, uh, in absolute terms, it was not a large magnitude of effect. But this was a very important study nonetheless, because this was really our first study that proved the hypothesis that adding a non-statin medication to a statin would further reduce cardiovascular risk, even in patients who are already fairly well treated. 
So uh, many folks paid attention to uh, this data and other data that was coming out at the time. Um, and since 2013, we've seen a number of different guidelines and statements that have come out suggesting that we not only put patients on appropriate uh, uh, statin therapy, appropriate intensity of statin therapy, but that we also target a specific LDL cholesterol goal. And ACE, um, uh, which is a, a, a group of endocrinologists in this country, were among the first to really come out with a strong statement about LDL goals. Um, and if you look on this slide, um, what they suggested is that very high-risk patients, such as our patient here who had established uh, uh, or recent hospitalization for ACS, um, in these very high-risk patients, we should not just be using appropriate intensity of statin, but we should also be targeting an LDL of less than 70. And they even uh, highlighted a group of individuals um, uh, who had progressive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and I think you could make an argument that our patient may even uh, fall into that uh, clinical criteria in this extreme risk group we should be targeting an LDL cholesterol of less than 55. So uh, in addition to the ACE document, the ACC, um, in both 2016 and then in 2017, uh, they updated uh, their consensus decision pathway on the role of non-statin therapies for uh, LDL cholesterol lowering in the management of LDL, uh, uh, in the management of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. Um, I will be talking about these guidelines uh, in a little bit more de or this uh, decision pathway in a few moments, but there are uh, a few things that I think are important to highlight about it. The first thing is that this retains the concept of four statin benefit groups. Um, so we should still be identifying patients into one of those four groups and giving them appropriate intensity of statin therapy. But as I'll highlight a little bit in just a few moments, they, this pathway does include uh, rationale for using non-statin therapy, particularly azetamide um, and PCSK9 inhibitors in specific high-risk individuals who don't get uh, appropriate reduction in LDL cholesterol with statin alone. So in general, um, what this guideline calls for is that in patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, such, a, as, a, such as our patient, we should be aiming for at least a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol, and we should be considering a target LDL of less than 70 and a target non-HDL of less than 100 to consider a patient to have appropriately controlled atherogenic lipoproteins. So into this uh, arena, uh, we can now uh, talk about PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, uh, this has allowed us, the uh, addition of PCSK9 inhibitors to our armamentarium um, uh, allows us to consider what might happen if we lower LDL cholesterol even lower than what we've seen in our statin studies, even lower than what we've seen in the Improve It uh, study. So this is uh, actually a very fast-moving story in terms of the development of PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors are a monoclonal antibody. The two that are available are, are, are fully human monoclonal antibodies uh, to this very important molecule, PCSK9. Uh, so these are given by injection, these molecules. And, and PCSK9 is a molecule that marks the LDL receptor for destruction. So if you're able to inhibit PCSK9, LDL receptors will cycle to the cell surface more, for a longer period of time and will pull more LDL cholesterol out of the bloodstream and into the liver, thus lowering uh, serum or lowering blood LDL cholesterol levels. And as I said, this has been a very fast-moving story. The first, uh, uh, the first studies of PCSK9 hap, uh, inhibitors were, were started in 2012, 2013, um, and, and demonstrated that we were able to lower LDL cholesterol uh, very significantly. And by 2015, there was enough data that was available that uh, both of the two available drugs, uh, uh, evolucumab and alirocumab, uh, were approved by the FDA. And now, just two years later, we actually have endpoint data, data with these studies that look at their effect on hard clinical endpoints um, that were published uh, in 2017 and presented in 2018, respectively. So this has really allowed us uh, to not just have uh, uh, other um, members of our armamentarium in treating uh, cardiovascular disease, but also has allowed us to test the hypothesis of what happens to these patients if we get their LDL cholesterol down well below 70, even down below 50 in most cases, because these agents do lower LDL cholesterol very significantly. If you look at this entire clinical program that I have uh, on this slide, what you see is a very consistent effect on LDL cholesterol. 
about a 55% reduction in LDL cholesterol. Um, you also see modest increase in HDL of about 6.9%. You see a 45% decrease in ApoB. And very interestingly, we also see about a 25% reduction in uh, uh, an LP little a. So this really has allowed us to test the hypothesis as to what happens if we lower LDL cholesterol even further than we've been able to do with our uh, therapies that were available before we had PCSK9 inhibitors. So there are two outcome studies that have either been published or presented, one with each of the approved PCSK9 inhibitors that are on the market. So for alirocumab, we have the Odyssey outcome study. For evolocumab, we have the Fourier study. These are both very large studies. As you can see with Odyssey, we're looking at about 19,000 patients. With Fourier, we're looking at almost 28,000 patients. Both of these studies looked at patients who had established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Odyssey outcomes focused on those who were post-ACS. Fourier looked at patients who had more stable atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The entry criteria was that you had to either have an MI, stroke, or peripheral arterial disease um, in the past. Both of these studies were designed very similarly. You had to be on evidence-based statin therapy, either moderate or high-intensity statin therapy. And despite that, you needed to have an LDLC of greater than 70, despite moderate or high-intensity statin therapy, to be included in the study. Uh, and then if you're included in the study, um, you stayed on that statin. So these patients all stayed on their statin, and then they were randomized to either receive a PCSK9 inhibitor, either every two weeks or every four weeks, depending on how the drugs were dosed. Um, and they were followed for a very, actually a very short period of time, just a little over two years in both of these studies. And both of these studies looked at a composite of hard, cardiovascular, of hard and soft cardiovascular endpoints um, uh, that are shown here on this slide. And uh, we'll be also talking about some of the, sub, uh, the secondary endpoints that uh, looked at what we often call hard clinical cardiovascular events. So first, uh, let's look at the Odyssey Outcomes Study in a little bit more detail. As I uh, highlighted earlier, uh, this was a study of almost 19,000 high-risk patients, all of whom had had uh, ACS from the preceding 1 to 12 months and who had an LDL cholesterol greater than 70 despite high-intensity statin. Um, these patients were then randomized to alirocumab or placebo, and they ended up follow it, being followed for a median of 2.8 years. And I'll just point out that our patient would have been potentially a qualifying candidate for the Odyssey Outcomes Study, having had a recent ACS um, and having poorly controlled uh, LDL cholesterol uh, despite his maximally tolerant statin therapy, which in his case was a, a moderate intensity statin. In any event, what's shown on this slide is the reduction in LDL cholesterol that was seen over the, the course of the study. As you see, uh, we're looking at about a 55% reduction in LDL cholesterol um, uh, between the statin-only group and the statin plus uh, uh, PCSK9 inhibitor group. And as you can see, that reduction in LDL cholesterol was very well maintained throughout the course of the clinical trial. And that reduction in LDL cholesterol led to about a 15% statistically significant reduction in the primary endpoint of the study, which was a composite of CHD death, MI stroke, or hospitalization for unstable angina. So 15% relative risk reduction, statistically significant, but also a 1.5, uh, 1.6% absolute risk reduction in the number of events. And I think it is important to, to highlight the number of events that did happen at, in this study. If you look out to almost uh, three years, which was the, the median follow-up in the study, almost 10% of people in the uh, statin alone group had another event. Um, so clearly there's residual risk in these patients, and we're able to decrease that residual risk to at least some extent by adding a PCSK9 inhibitor on top of that evidence-based statin therapy. In terms of subgroups analysis, um, one of the, the things that I think was very important that came out of this study is that patients who had a higher LDL cholesterol at baseline got a, a larger effect both in terms both relatively and absolutely by uh, being uh, 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 randomized to PCSK9 inhibitor. So if you look on the right side of this slide, uh, patients who have had a baseline uh, LDL greater than 100 seem to get have the highest event rates in the statin-only arm, 
but also had the greatest reduction in events um, in the uh, arm that was uh, added a PCSK9 inhibitor. This uh, uh, slide here looks at some of the secondary outcomes. I always like to highlight uh, what's shown in the middle of the slide, which we often uh, call hard clinical endpoints, which is death, MI, and ischemic stroke. These are among the easiest endpoints to adjudicate. And as you see here, there was a 14% statistically significant reduction um, in that important secondary endpoint. Interestingly, if you look at all-cause death, we actually see a uh, a reduction in all-cause death in this study with a marginal or nominal p-value of, of 0 0.026. Um, uh, but certainly uh, everything, all of the endpoints in the study uh, seem to be going in the right direction, uh, favoring the addition of a PCSK9 inhibitor uh, over and above statin therapy alone. When looking at a relatively new therapy, though, it's important to not just look at efficacy. We need to look at side effects as well. Um, so this looks at key safety. This slide looks at key safety endpoints uh, that were seen in the Odyssey outcome study. And as you can see, uh, starting at the bottom of this slide, really no difference in, in any adverse events uh, or in serious adverse events. Um, we see really no difference in important laboratory values like ALT and CK really no difference in uh, new onset diabetes or worsening diabetes complications. Um, there was, however, a slight increase in an in allergic reaction, injection site reaction, um, both of which occurred just a little bit more with alirocumab uh, than with placebo. There was no difference in neurocognitive disorders, no difference in cataracts, and there was no difference in hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so uh, important to balance the efficacy um, with this safety profile that we saw in this uh, study that uh, where patients were exposed to PCSK9 inhibitor uh, for about two and a half years. As I mentioned earlier, this, there, that was one of two endpoint studies we already have available to us with PCSK9s. Uh, the second of these is uh, known as the Fourier study. This was study was actually published first. The study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. And this study looked at a slightly different patient population, also patients who had established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, but it enrolled 28,000 patients who had more stable atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They needed either a history of MI, a history of, P of PAD, or a history of ischemic stroke uh, to get into the study. Similar to Odyssey outcomes, they needed uh, to qualify for the study. Uh, they needed to have an achieved LDL cholesterol of greater than 70 despite, maximally, despite either moderate or high-intensity statin. So these patients were on moderate uh, to, or high-intensity statin and has, still had an LDL of uh, greater than 70, were randomized to either receive evolocumab or placebo on top of that statin, so they continued on their statin. And this study went on for a median of uh, 26 months um, before it was stopped uh, due to the efficacy uh, that was seen. So once again, here on this slide, we see the LDL cholesterol uh, differences between the two groups, a uh, very significant reduction, uh, about a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol um, over and above what we saw with statin therapy alone. Um, uh, when we added uh, evolucumab. And once again, you can see that that, uh, that reduction in LDL cholesterol was well maintained throughout the course of the study. In terms of the primary endpoint of the study, that additional reduction in LDL cholesterol led to a 15% reduction in the primary endpoint, which was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, or coronary revascularization. And once again, I will highlight not just the relative risk reduction, but the absolute risk reduction of about 2% uh, that we saw um, in patients who were followed out to uh, almost three years. And that uh, this is a, a group of individuals who are at high risk of recurrent events. Um, the residual risk in these patients was significant. In the uh, group that was treated with statins alone, uh, there was a 14% uh, chance they would have another event, and that was reduced by absolute numbers uh, by about 2% um, uh, in the group that received a PCSK9 inhibitor in addition to their statin. If we uh, look a little bit further at uh, some important secondary endpoints, this slide looks at those hard clinical endpoints, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke, um, in which once again we see a 20% reduction in uh, events in patients who received a PCSK9 inhibitor 
uh, on top of a statin. And once again, a fairly significant absolute risk reduction um, in this patient population. If we divide that down a little bit further, um, we see that there were reductions both in uh, ischemic stroke and in fatal and non-fatal MI, um, but there were no significant differences um, in cardiovascular death in this study. And similar to the data that I showed you in uh, the previous, uh, uh, with the previous study, similar to data with the Odyssey Outcome Study, in Fourier, it did seem like the lower the LDL, uh, the, I'm sorry, the higher the LDL cholesterol was at baseline, the better benefit that was received, the greater the magnitude of benefit that was received by patients being uh, randomized to evolocumab as compared to placebo. So once again, we're beginning to see a patient population or a couple of patient populations uh, being identified that may get greater benefit from uh, the addition of a PCSK9 inhibitor than other subgroups. Here on this slide, we see the key safety endpoints for the Fourier study. Um, uh, so in general, uh, if we looked at all uh, adverse events or serious adverse events, really no difference uh, between the evolucumab or placebo group. Um, if we look at uh, neurocognitive events, cataract, rhabdo, we, uh, even muscle-related events, really no difference um, between the two. We did see a, a slight increase, a modest increase in allergic reaction and in injection site reaction. And there was also a modest increase in uh, new onset diabetes that was seen in the evolucumab group. I will just highlight the neurocognitive events for, for one moment. It was actually recognizing that these patients were going to end up with a very low LDL cholesterol. Um, uh, prior to these studies, there was some concern that we may see some neurocognitive effects um, with uh, PCSK9 in inhibition and with achieving those very low uh, LDL le uh, levels. So there was a pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis uh, that was done uh, on uh, a, a small group of over almost 2,000 patients in the Fourier study who had extensive neurocognitive testing done uh, before the study and then at study close. And importantly, that pre-specified subgroup saw no difference in neurocognitive events uh, between those randomized to a PCSK9 inhibitor and those randomized to placebo. One of the questions that certainly does come up is how about our, uh, our patients that end up with very low LDL cholesterols? Uh, one of the things that we saw in the Fourier study was that there were a number of patients who actually ended up with an achieved LDL cholesterol of less than 10. Uh, not surprisingly, these patients were all in the PCSK9 inhibitor group. Um, and so it, post uh, hoc, one of the things that was done was to compare this group of individuals who did achieve uh, an LDL of less than 10, compare them to those who didn't have as robust an LDL response, um, patients whose LDL, for this particular analysis, we're looking at patients whose LDL remained above 100. These patients were almost exclusively in the placebo group. And as you can see, if you compare these two groups, we see that those who achieved that low LDL had a significant reduction um, in cardiovascular events, um, either looking at the primary endpoint or that key secondary endpoint of cardiovascular disease, MI, or stroke. And there was really no difference in adverse events overall, uh, drug discontinuation, or in serious adverse events. Um, so once again, highlighting what appears to be a, a very uh, a nice safety profile, um, even from getting LDL cholesterols down well below what we've been able to achieve with statin therapy. In this uh, slide, we're looking at uh, what happens in specific high-risk groups um, in the Fourier study. Uh, this uh, slide on the left uh, particularly looks at patients uh, who had uh, peripheral arterial disease. Um, we know that patients who have per uh, peripheral arterial disease um, are at higher risk of uh, having recurrent events. Um, and so we saw a very significant reduction um, in, uh, in events when patients were randomized. Uh, to PCSK9 inhibitor. It was a 27% relative risk reduction, uh, but because event rates were so high in that population, uh, we saw an absolute risk reduction of 3.5%. Uh, looking on the right side of this slide, we are looking at another high risk group, which are those who had an elevated HSCRP coming into the study. And once again, if you uh, look at patients who had a, a CRP of greater than three, uh, once again, we saw higher event rates and we saw a more robust uh, response in terms of relative and absolute risk reduction in those patients. And so one of the things that comes out of some of the subgroup analyses 
both from this study and from the Odyssey Outcome Study, is that we're beginning to look at particular subgroups that may benefit from PCSK9 inhibitor more than other subgroups of individuals. And that, I think, was highlighted nicely on this slide here, which looks at an approach to where we might be getting our best bang for our buck in terms of adding non-statin therapy to statin therapy. And what you see on the, the right upper corner of this slide is identified a group of very high-risk individuals where it may make sense to use non-statin therapy and, and particularly may make sense to achieve very low LDL cholesterols such that we can achieve with uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, these are mostly patients who have a clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but who have at least one other risk factor that puts them at high risk of recurrence. So either diabetes or uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, multiple poorly controlled risk factors, recent acute coronary syndrome, such as the patient that we've been discussing during this program, polyvascular disease, that is disease in more than one vascular bed, someone who has coronary disease, and peripheral vascular disease, for example, patients who are older, patients who have multiple recurrent events, and patients who have elevated lipoprotein A, which once again, those last two also potentially fit our patient that we are talking about in this program. So in, in looking at the data that's available, in 2017, uh, the National Lipid Association uh, convened an expert panel to recommend where we should be thinking about using PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, and uh, I, I do a lot of work with the NLA, and I think this is a, a very nice document and, and certainly a great read if you have an opportunity to take a look at it. We've highlighted uh, the, uh, the main points um, uh, from that document here on this slide. Um, and so really what it boils down to is that in patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, who are on maximally tolerated statin therapy, but have an LDL cholesterol that's greater than 70, that's a patient population we should be at least thinking about using a PCSK9 inhibitor in. It also gives some advice about patients who have heterozygous FH, or at least the phenotype of heterozygous FH, um, in patients uh, who are uh, over the age of 40, um, who have uh, uh, other uncontrolled risk factors or have key risk markers, we should be considering a PCSK9 inhibitor in those who have an LDL of greater than 70. Um, in patients who uh, have a phenotype of FH, that is LDL greater than 190, and are either less than 40 years of age or who don't have a, a uncontrolled risk factors, um, we should be thinking about a PCSK9 inhibitor in patients whose LDL remains greater than 100 despite adequate statin therapy. And I think uh, uh, the guideline that is uh, are probably the most contemporary or the recommendations that are most contemporary regarding non-statin therapy is the 2017 update uh, to the ACC uh, recommended pathway for non-statin therapy. This is a, a very contemporary document um, that I think uh, combines a lot of the thoughts um, from the other uh, recommendations that we've highlighted in this program and also really looks closely, I think, at the uh, outcome studies that we have available for us um, in terms of, of PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, and I think that this is something that we, we, we tend to follow in our practice, in, in our lipid center. Um, when you look at a patient who has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, obviously, once again, this guideline says that the first thing we want to do is make sure that they are on appropriate intensity of statin therapy, which for most of these patients will be high-intensity statin therapy, unless they don't tolerate high-intensity statin therapy or they're over 75 years of age, where we might want to consider starting with moderate, intensive, uh, with moderate statin therapy. And then um, in patients, particularly those who have comorbidities, patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or comorbidities or who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and have FH, um, if we don't see a reduction of 50% in LDL or, importantly, if the LDL cholesterol remains above 70, we should be thinking about adding a non-statin therapy. So LDL above 70 in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and an LDL that remains above 70, we should be thinking about adding either ezetimibe or a PCSK9 inhibitor. And I think that the, uh, the, the small print at the bottom of this slide is a very important part of this recommendation. In general, what it suggests is that if a patient is within about 
of their goal, they only require an addition, a less than 25% uh, additional reduction in LDL cholesterol, um, uh, we might want to consider azetamide because that should be able to get us about a 25% reduction in LDL cholesterol and probably can get us to goal. And it's obviously a less expensive therapy than PCSK9 inhibitors. And we should be really reserving PCSK9 inhibitors for those patients who really need them. And that includes patients who are going to require a greater than 25% additional LDL reduction to get to goal. So patients whose LDL cholesterol is around 90 or above. Um, those are the patients uh, with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease where we might want to be thinking about using a PCSK9 inhibitor rather than using azetamide. So I think that's a, it's a very important concept and I think one that we need to continue to work through as providers who treat patients who have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and now have access to what is a very effective therapy but is also a very expensive therapy. PCSK9 inhibitors are, are quite expensive and I think the responsibility is really upon us as providers to make sure that we are using these agents when appropriate but only when appropriate. So when we can get patients to goal with other therapies, that's probably what we should be doing. And what you see on this slide is a, a simulation model that's based on some uh, medical and pharmacy claims. It's over 100,000 medical and pharmacy claims that really look at what it takes to get patients down to below, say, 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter, which is the, the target that the ACC document has recommended. And what you'll see if you look on the right side of this slide is that the vast majority of patients should be able to get to an LDLC of below 70 with high intensity statin and azetamide, or some of them even less intensive statin, uh, less intensive uh, uh, therapy than that. Um, and it's really only somewhere around 10 to 15% of patients that should require a PCSK9 inhibitor in order to reach that type of, uh, of achieved LDL cholesterol. And I think, once again, this really is, I think, helpful to us when we speak to uh, others who are concerned about the cost of these agents, that we're really not talking about the use of these agents in all patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We're really trying to limit to those who really need this drug. So I think that very easily leads back to our treatment case. So just to review, um, our case today is a, a patient who has uh, had a recent acute coronary syndrome. This was a recurrent event. Um, this patient was unable to tolerate high intensity statin, so remains on simvastatin 40, which is a moderate intensity statin, and had azitamide 10 milligrams a day added after this most recent acute coronary syndrome. His follow-up lipid panel eight weeks after the addition of azitamide um, is shown here. LDLC achieved of 101, HDL of 38, triglycerides of 168, and a lipoprotein A of 90. So I think we are now prepared to answer the question, what if any change to his lipid lowering regimen is warranted? And I think based on the data that we've shown um, with the endpoint studies that we have available to us and looking at the consensus pathway that was published by the ACC, uh, this is a patient who is relatively far from goal, has an achieved LDL cholesterol that's greater than 100, also has multiple different risk factors for why this patient may end up back in the hospital with a cardiovascular event if we are not treating his cholesterol more aggressively. And this would seem to be an excellent candidate for a PCSK9 inhibitor. So you, as a very diligent uh, provider who recognizes um, the, uh, the opportunity in this patient, prescribe a PCSK9 inhibitor. But, and this is very consistent with my experience, um, after that first prescription is written, you are notified that you need to uh, submit a prior authorization, you receive a form, you fill out that form, you send it back to the pharmacy, and you learn that the prior authorization is denied. So this, unfortunately, is, is something that happens very frequently when we prescribe PCSK9 inhibitors and other relatively expensive medications, and, and uh, this uh, I think is, uh, raises a number of different practical issues that we should be addressing in making sure that we are getting uh, this drug or these drugs uh, to the patients who really need them. And once again, I think the, the first part of this is making sure that we are using the drug in the right patients. Once again, the onus is on us to identify those very high-risk patients who are likely to get the greatest benefit 
from uh, use of a PCSK9 inhibitor. So what you see on this slide um, is some of the prescribing information for both of these drugs. And I'll go through it uh, uh, fairly quickly. And uh, obviously, this data is all available in uh, the uh, uh, monographs for both of these drugs, which I do urge you to read if you're going to prescribe these drugs. Uh, Alarocumab, which was studied in the, uh, in the Odyssey Outcome Study, is indicated as an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statins for adults with either uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who require additional LDL uh, cholesterol lowering. Uh, it can be given as uh, either 75 milligrams or 150 milligrams um, in a, a pre-filled pen every two weeks, um, or you can give 300 milligrams um, once again, in those same pre-filled pens once a month. Um, as we talked about earlier, side effect profile, we do see some increase in nasopharyngitis, injection site reactions, and hypersensitivity reactions, but otherwise is a very well-tolerated medication. Evolocumab had their indication updated in December of 2017 after the publication of the Fourier data. Um, Evolocumab is now indicated as an adjunct to a diet, to diet a maximally tolerated statin therapy for adults with heterozygous FH, um, or in patients with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease um, who require additional lowering of LDL cholesterol uh, to reduce the risk of MI, stroke, coron and coronary revascularization in adults with established cardiovascular disease. Um, it's available, uh, once again, as a pre-filled syringe of 140 milligrams, um, which can be given every two weeks. Um, or there is an uh, on-body auto-injector that's available, um, which is, uh, allows 420 milligrams uh, to be delivered once a month. Uh, once again, very well tolerated. Side effects include nasopharyngitis, injection site reactions, and hypersensitivity reactions. So uh, access to these PCSK9 inhibitors has been somewhat restricted by a, a number of formularies, um, but as we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, um, that access is certainly improving with the uh, publication and presentation of some of the endpoint data that I shared with you. Um, in general, you can expect that with your initial prescription of a PCSK9 inhibitor, most formularies are going to ask for a prior authorization. Sometimes that prior authorization goes through, sometimes that prior authorization will uh, need an appeal, um, but uh, we want to give you some tools that can help you to get those prior authorizations or those appeals approved quickly, as quickly and easily as possible. So I think really the first uh, part of that is ensuring that we are using the drug in the right patient population. Um, we've really seen that already in this talk, that we can identify patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who are at higher risk of recurrent events, those who remain greater than 25%, uh, uh, those who need an, at least a 25% reduction in their LDL cholesterol to get to goal despite maximally tolerated statin therapy. And many times we're looking at patients who have other risk factors that may make them at higher risk uh, to have a recurrent event. Those are really the patients that we need to fight the hardest to get PCSK9 inhibitor therapy uh, into their hands. Um, in general, the most common reasons that uh, a prior authorization for a PCSK9 inhibitor uh, is denied is documentation. It always ends up being documentation. And there are really three things that we talk about when we talk about uh, a documentation. I think those are highlighted uh, best uh, on this uh, next slide, uh, which is entitled, Tips to Increase the Likelihood of PCSK9 Inhibitor Approval. I think the most important thing to document is that we clearly are documenting why that patient is at high risk. For patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it's important to document the type of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, how that was documented, and of course, if they have any other high-risk characteristics, like this was a recurrent event, or they also have uncontrolled risk factors, like they continue to smoke, or they have polyvascular disease, um, they have very high LDL cholesterols, they have concomitant FH, those types of things that, that are easily identifiable as making this patient a high-risk candidate with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Documenting that is very important. And then for those who have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is the other high-risk patient population that we're generally prescribing PCSK9 inhibitors, really uh, identifying or documenting how you made that diagnosis. Many folks uh, will recommend that you actually calculate a Dutch Lipid Clinic Network score 
Personally, I don't really think that that's uh, necessary on all patients. We'll often use the NLA definition of FH, um, which is a high baseline uh, LDL cholesterol with either a personal or a family history of premature cardiovascular events. But the documentation as to how you came to that diagnosis is important. That's the first thing. The second thing is why this patient is on maximally tolerated statin therapy. So really a, a nice detailed but concise uh, history of statin therapy. In many of these patients, there are going to be on a high-intensity statin, but we have maximum dose of a high-intensity statin, but some patients may not be able to tolerate a high-intensity statin. So documenting that you've tried multiple statins, multiple doses, and that you have this patient on maximally tolerated statin uh, dose is very important uh, to document as well. And then we need to document their most recent LDL cholesterol, um, and usually it's nice to have a, a, an LDL within 30 days uh, to send in with your prior authorization. And it's important just to highlight whether or not you feel uh, that that LDL cholesterol is appropriately controlled. Um, so um, it, it, identifying if, if that LDL cholesterol, what your goal is for that patient, where that goal came from, did it come from the AACC document, and then whether or not that patient would be expected to get to goal with the various treatments that are available. So we try to be very, uh, very concise, but very uh, complete in terms of our documentation for our, both our, our prior authorizations and our appeal letters, making sure that it's very clear what the, is the indication, why are they at high risk, documenting that they're on maximum uh, tolerated statin therapy, and then documenting that their LDL cholesterol with a recent lab shows suboptimal control. In our experience, organizing a multidisciplinary team within our clinic has been really uh, one of our key uh, components of our success. We're able to get the vast majority of patients able to get the drug approved, um, either on our initial, uh, uh, initial uh, uh, submission of a prior authorization form or on appeal. We usually get these drugs approved mostly because we're using it in appropriate patients who really are going to get benefit from the drug. But also, I think we've put together a team, a multidisciplinary team, that can really help in, in terms of making sure the documentation is correct and making sure that documentation is going to the right people. So that includes not just myself and, and some of the nurse practitioners that I work with, but also we have a clinical pharmacist in our office who's been dedicated to this project. And perhaps the most important member of that team, we have a medical assistant who is, uh, handles all of our submissions and is very well versed in the different programs that are available um, and is well versed in making sure that everybody is documenting appropriately before we send in that prior authorization. And our success, I think, has mirrored um, what others have seen um, in the literature, which is if you use a team and, and that team meticulously documents all the data required for PA approval and manages appeals properly, you can see success rates of over 90% in terms of getting uh, patients uh, approved to get the drug from their formulary. So there are a number of different tools that are available. Um, highlighted on this slide, you see a, a uniform a prior authorization form and a form letter that you can use um, or you can, uh, um, uh, you can adjust for your own purposes. Um, this comes from an a, a, a article by Baum and all that was in clinical cardiology. Uh, you can download this article, which has these uh, forms available in that article, um, and we've used, uh, particularly the letter, uh, we've taken the letter and reformatted it in our clinic, um, and we use that, that, uh, that common appeal letter um, for all of our appeals, which, um, number one, makes sure everything is documented appropriately, but by having a form also minimizes the amount of staff time that we need to take on writing some of these appeal letters. I think it's also incumbent upon us um, to take advantage of uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, the uh, opportunities we have to uh, shine a light on the problem that we have oftentimes in getting prior authorization for medications we think our patients need. Uh, the ACC is very interested in this, and uh, because of that, they've developed a prior authorization reporting tool uh, where they are trying to track some of the problems that we face in terms of getting appropriate prior authorization. So I urge you to take a look at the website. Um, that is uh, noted at the bottom of this slide, um, which um, uh, can track the process um, in terms of prior authorization reporting, but also offers some important practice tips for how to get prior authorizations approved.
And uh, there's also this nice checklist. Uh, we once again have a similar checklist that we've developed for our office. Uh, this particular checklist is from the NLA, and this just makes sure that uh, when somebody, in our, our case, we have our medical assistant review this checklist, make sure that there's documentation for all of these things in the documentation that we're sending off um, to get prior authorization. Um, so once again, you can download this checklist um, from, the NASH, from the NLA website. So once we have prior authorization for the drug, the second issue that we will often run into in terms of access is high out-of-pocket costs for PCSK9 inhibitors. So once again, just because a drug is approved doesn't mean that it's going to be inexpensive for payers. Um, I'm sorry, inexpensive for patients. Um, so many patients will have high out-of-pocket costs. Um, luckily, as I'll show you uh, on the next slide, um, there is a copay card that's available for patients with commercial insurance um, for both of the two available drugs. Um, uh, those copay cards uh, make sure that patients generally pay no more than $5 a month uh, for their drug. But uh, uh, as I'm sure you are all aware, um, we cannot use those cards or patients uh, cannot use those cards if they're on Medicare Part D plans. And the out-of-pocket expenses can be very significant for patients who are on Medicare Part D. I'd say this is one of the, the major uh, obstacles that we have uh, to getting uh, the drugs uh, into the patients who need them. Um, the average out-of-pocket cost for a Medicare Part D participant um, in, uh, in getting a PCSK9 inhibitor is about $330 a month which is generally unaffordable for most of our patients. And coming up with that number is relatively complex, and it can be complex in working with a patient in terms of how much it's going to cost them. Because, of course, there is the initial coverage phase where the patient will be paying one uh, cost. And then, in many cases, uh, this will push, the high cost of this medicine will push patients into the coverage gap, uh, commonly known as the donut hole, where they'll be paying more, not just for their PCSK9 inhibitor, but for other drugs, um, but then they'll also sort of push through that donut hole towards the end of the year frequently um, and end up having the drug and their other drugs covered at a much lower rate. So it can be very difficult sometimes to just answer the question of how much is this going to cost me out of pocket. Luckily, both of the companies that, uh, that make the two drugs, drugs, alirocumab and evolocumab, have uh, put together uh, uh, specialist programs um, where they can support providers in going through some of these issues with uh, patients and with your staff. Um, so first of all, both companies do have a copay card, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so patients will, will generally pay you know, no more than $5 a month. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is many patients who qualify for these copay cards don't actually use them. So it's just important to remind patients on commercial insurance that they, these copay cards are available. Um, in terms of, of uh, patients who are on government insurance, um, there are special, specialist programs um, available, insurance specialists, um, that are available for both companies that you can access online or by phone that can help walk your patient or somebody in your staff through the different programs that are available to individual patients and help to even define what the out-of-pocket expense will be uh, for a particular patient. Uh, so we make uh, use of both of these programs. And if you look these drugs up online, um, you can find out how to access those programs uh, for your staff and for your patients. Um, it, there is additional, both of these companies do have additional assistance that's available for some patients. And we're also seeing that with the publication of the outcomes data, uh, both Odyssey outcomes and uh, the Fourier study, um, that most of our payers are making the process a little bit easier. And drug companies are working carefully with these providers uh, to try to streamline the process for patients who really need these drugs. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that over the next year or so, we're going to see that this process gets even easier and easier for us to get the drug into the hands of the right patients. And I, I think part of the reason why we are going to see this um, is uh, because really the costs that are associated with the drug can be mitigated if we really use the drug in the right patients, in patients who are truly high risk and really can't get to goal with other available less expensive therapies. And, and what you see on this slide is some interesting modeling that came out of the VA system um, where if 
quite frankly, uh, every patient who could possibly be enrolled in the Fourier study, that is pretty much all patients who have established cardiovascular disease were all, and had an LDL greater than 70, were all prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor, you see an incredible cost to the VA system. But if instead, if you look on the right side of this slide, if instead of that strategy of just giving all these patients a PCSK9 inhibitor, if instead we say, all right, how can we intensify and maximize non-PCSK9 inhibitor uh, therapy first? Make sure that we're trying to get these patients on a high-intensity statin. Using azetamide, if it is warranted, if it's going to be able to get a patient to goal, and then only looking at patients who aren't able to get to goal uh, with high-intensity statin and potentially with azetamide, which you see is a, a much more reasonable cost to the system. So once again, this just highlights that, that concept I keep coming back to, which is that it's really incumbent upon us as providers to identify patients who are going to get the most benefit from this drug, do everything that we can to maximize their non-PCSK9 inhibitor therapy before we uh, move to PCSK9 inhibitors that may be expensive both for the healthcare system and for our patient. So moving back to our case, as we talked about this patient, as established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease um, with a recent acute coronary syndrome. Um, this patient has a number of high-risk characteristics that uh, uh, suggest high residual risk for a, a subsequent event. Um, those include uh, an LDL cholesterol that's not at what would be considered an appropriate goal. The patient also has a high lipoprotein A level, um, and uh, this patient's had recurrent events. Um, and so this would seem to be a patient who's a good candidate for a uh, PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, you prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor. That PA was initially denied, but you subsequently sent in a letter um, that explained why it was that this patient was at high risk and why they fit ACC criteria um, to be on a PCSK9 inhibitor. So you eventually were able to get the drug approved, and uh, this patient had a follow-up lipid profile 12 weeks, weeks later uh, that showed an LDL that was achieved of 45, and interestingly, LP little a also came down to 60. Uh, so now we have a patient whose LDL cholesterol is at goal, um, less than 70, uh, and well less than 70. And I think now we're faced with that sort of interesting question as to whether or not this patient should continue on their azitamide or whether or not you could potentially stop the azitamide in this patient, um, which is a, a whole other discussion um, that uh, we won't go into today. So I appreciate your time in, in going through all of that data, um, but I think it's nice to, to just take a, an hour and really see the entire story uh, from uh, beginning to end with a patient and, and to really see how it is that we can get uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, how we can identify patients that are going to get the greatest benefit from them, and, and how once we identify those patients, uh, we can get it into their hands. So here you see our take-home messages from this presentation today. I think uh, despite the fact that we spent most of our time talking about PCSK9 inhibitors, I think it's uh, important to, to recognize that statins remain the cornerstone of therapy in patients at high cardiovascular risk. They are, uh, uh, they are absolutely the first-line therapy, and using appropriate uh, doses, uh, either a moderate intensity or high-intensity uh, statin, as called for our ACCHA guidelines, is the first step. Uh, secondly, quantitative approaches that estimate cardiovascular risk uh, uh, can determine those who are most likely to benefit from non-statin therapies, although I think usually we're looking at qualitative approaches uh, in identifying patients who are at higher risk. The currently approved PCSK9 inhibitors achieve significant reductions in LDL cholesterol when used alone or, or added to statin therapy. In general, at least a, an additional 50% reduction over what you see with statins alone. And on top of a background of statin therapy, both PCSK9 inhibitors were, have been shown in very short studies, uh, studies that uh, went on for only two to three years. Both were shown to reduce the rate of adverse cardiovascular events in patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular events and ACS, respectively, and to do so with a very acceptable rate of adverse uh, side effects. Um, I think that probably perhaps the most important thing that came out of those studies, the Odyssey Outcome Study and the Fourier Study, is that they did prove the hypothesis that LDL cholesterol is important in the pathogenesis of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and that lowering LDL cholesterol with non-statin therapy adds incremental benefit 
in reducing cardiovascular events. We talked about the fact that uh, as many as 80% of PCSK9 inhibitor prescriptions are not approved initially. Uh, we talked about the importance of documentation in getting that prior authorization approved. We also talked about using a team-based approach and using published resources from the ACC, the NLA, and the ASP, uh, ASPC uh, in order to help with the uh, uh, prior authorization process. We also talked about ways um, in patients who have been approved for the drug to help lower out-of-pocket costs, including use of the copay cards um, and uh, potentially uh, using uh, support programs from both of the companies that make this drug in order to uh, help work with individual patients lower their out-of-pocket costs. So that I want to thank you very much for joining me for this program today. You will now be directed back to the landing page. Please complete the post-test and evaluation to receive your CE credit, and thank you for participating in this program.